good afternoon and welcome to the cardiovascular uh, series uh, from the Institute and the Department of Radiology, Surgery, and the Interval Medicine. <coughs> uh, this is like those kind of sessions like East meet the West. You know, this is a, a course of lectures that are translational research. The first Monday of the month, we do basic sciences, the cardiovascular research, and the second Monday of the month, the clinical application. You know, uh, so we're very pleased with this happening. Uh, this is a great way of doing that translational research, bringing from the lab to clinical practice. And uh, today we have associate professor of radiology, Dr. Romulo Bea, the chief of the intervention of radiology, that will give us a lecture on the management of hemoptysis. Romulo? Okay. okay. I will be uh, presenting two cases, but uh, before we do that, these are my objectives. Number one, <coughs> I will give an overview on the management of hemoptysis. Number two, overview on the use of <coughs> bronchial artery embolization. And then number three, uh, I will <coughs> uh, give you a tour on the management of cystic fibrosis with the massive hemoptysis, and let's take a look at the evidence-based medicine. And then number four will be just a show and tell. We don't have time to discuss, but it is a very interesting case. Uh, <coughs> presenting with massive hemoptysis with an unusual AVM coming from the internal mammary and then uh, draining into the right upper and uh, inferior pulmonary vein. So how we, do we define <coughs> hemoptysis by quant quantity? It's based on the amount that is lost during the, every episode. Mild, <clears throat> they call it mild when it's just about less than 60. And we call it massive, it is more than 100 cc to 600 cc within 24 hours. And life threatening if it is more than 120 cc of blood loss in an hour. So this is emphasized with the resident. You don't gauge it by dropping H and H. And number two, it is not based on the absolute amount. It is based on what amount will threaten the patient to go into asphyxia. <coughs> of course, I cannot emphasize it's very significant. It is a significant underlying disease. Massive hemoptysis <coughs> can result to threatening, uh, life-threatening asphyxia. And then I have to emphasize that mortality could be as high as 80% or even 100%. Etiology, just bear with me. It could be from the uh, upper airway. It could be from the GI tract, so you have to di differentiate it from GI tract bleeding that has regurgitated into the airway. Tracheobronchial source, there are a, <coughs> a list of them, neoplasm, bronchitis, bronchiectasis, bronchiolitis, airway trauma, foreign body, and pulmonary pharyngeal source, lung abscess, pneumonia, <coughs> TB, mycetoma, good posture syndrome, idiopathic uh, hemosiderosis, Wagener's granulomatosis, lupus, and lung contusion. As far as the vascular anomaly, AVM, <coughs> and then pulmonary embolism, mitral stenosis because of the chronic venous stasis, sometimes the rupture and could go into uh, <coughs> intermittent and chronic uh, hemoptysis. Pulmonary artery rupture this is one of the iodinic complications of a <coughs> uh, uh, balloon tip uh, swan gans catheter miscellaneous causes, endometriosis, systemic coagulopathy, or the uh, <coughs> inappropriate use of uh, anticoagulant and thrombolytic agents. But <coughs> let's concentrate on the massive causes. One is TB, number two is aspergillosis, number three is bronchiectasis, number four is cystic fibrosis, <coughs> next is lung abscess, then it could be a congenital heart lesion, pulmonary atresia or pulmonic stenosis, or chronic pulmonary thrombolysis and lung cancer. <clears throat> Before we do uh, <clears throat> bronchial artery embolization, you have to be familiarized with the variations in the anatomy. One classification is by Caldwell. Type one, you have two bronchial and one intercostal bronchial trunk. This is a majority of cases, 41%. Class two, we have one bronchial and one intercostal bronchial trunk. <clears throat> Class three, you have <coughs> one bronchial, one common trunk, and then one <coughs> right intercostal bronchial trunk. 
and then <coughs> uh, <coughs> class four, two bronchial, one right bronchial, and one right in costal bronchial trunk. Another classification is <coughs> given by Botenga, but I think the m most widely used is the, <coughs> the one by Caldwell. This is a more detailed one. <coughs> Type one is two left bronchial and one right <coughs> intercostal bronchial trunk with about 28% of cases. <coughs> the next common one is one left bronchial and one right intercostal bronchial trunk. The third one in about 17%, one, <coughs> one left, one common, and one right intercostal bronchial trunk. <coughs> Type four, two left bronchial, one right, and one in costal bronchial trunk, about 11, 11%. And <coughs> the uh, <coughs> class number five, <coughs> one left bronchial, one right bronchial, and one costal <coughs> intercostal bronchial trunk, about 8.5% of cases. And one common bronchial trunk, and one right I ICBT, or inter intercostal bronchial trunk. And the least common one is one common bronchial trunk serving both the left and the right <coughs> bronchial arterial circulation. So this is an intercostal bronchial trunk. You will see it supplies the bronchial arteries <coughs> and then as well as the in up, upper intercostals. This is a, <coughs> a, pure inter uh, inter a pure left bronchial artery on the left side. This is again a pure right bronchial. And we have to be reminded the source of massive bleeding, massive hemoptysis is non-bronchial in about 45% of cases. It could be from the intercostal, it could be from the lateral thoracic, it could be from the inferior phrenic, or it could be coming from the internal mammary. And <clears throat> don't forget about congenital heart lesions, obstructive lesions to the pulmonary blood flow. This is a severe tetralogy flow or pulmonary valve atresia. You will see the network of systemic collaterals that could potentially bleed. <clears throat> How about bleeding from the pulmonary arterial system? It is about 8% in one of the series, a series of 306. <clears throat> in other series, a smaller one, uh, 72, uh, similar, similar prevalence, about 8.4%. So right away, if you are presented with uh, <coughs> uh, hemoptysis, the best bet will be to go into the bronchial circulation and then next into the non-bronchial circulation. Then if it's still negative, then you have to go to a pulmonary arteriogram. And for that reason, there are some advocates of uh, doing an MDCT before the bronchial artery embolization, but the, the, uh, uh, the opinion and consensus is divided. But I will be showing you at least one evidence based on this. <coughs> so <coughs> this is just a review for our medical students. So <coughs> this is uh, <coughs> bronchiectasis. So what happens now with bronchitis? Chronic inflammation. And the chronic inflammation now will incite the bronchial artery to hypertrophy. They become hypervascular. They become enlarged, they become tortoise. What happens now? The tension within the blood vessel is increased because of the increasing diameter, plus the fragility induced by the inflammation. These are prone to bleed and cause hemoptysis. Another one, uh, caseous necrosis in tuberculosis. You would see in here. And then what happens now? There is also caseous necrosis of the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes could erode into the bronchial, <coughs> bronchial tree, causing hemoptysis and at the same time would incite inflammatory reaction <coughs> to cause the bronchial artery to enlarge, to become hypertrophied with a lot of hypervascular branches. This is a, uh, a, fung <coughs> a fungal infection of the lung. You will see the cavity, you will see the fungus ball, and then similarly, <coughs> an abscess, inflammatory reaction, causing enlargement of the bronchial artery, and then prone to bleed and cause <coughs> massive hemoptysis. This is a fung uh, fungal ball, a spergilioma. What happens now, you will see the uh, fungal elements. And one, <coughs> one variety of the uh, aspergillosis is angio-invasive. So what happens now, they invade the blood vessels and at the same time would cause massive hemoptysis. How about <coughs> cavitary tuberculosis? So what happens now, you will see in here, the cavity is adjacent to a pulmonary artery and this will, this will cause formation of Rasmussen aneurysm. And this Rasmussen aneurysm could be fed by a non-bronchial systemic circulation. So what happens now, this becomes exposed to systemic blood and the pressure is higher because of the exposure to systemic uh, pressure. 
what happens now, they are prone to bleed and could cause massive life-threatening hemoptysis in tuberculosis. Cystic <coughs> bronchiectasis, you can have uh, yeah, acquired mucosil, mucus plug. At the same time, enlargement of the lymph nodes. And then they could erode into the bronchial tree, causing hemoptysis. How about bronchogenic carcinoma? They could also recruit supply from the uh, systemic circulation. They become <laughs> hypervascular. They are prone to bleed. And then they could also be <laughs> supplied by the systemic circulation. That's like in, the, in this particular case. A pulmonary artery <coughs> segment is being, uh, is being fed by these branches from the uh, uh, break uh, from the uh, uh, subclavian. And because this is exposed to systemic pressure, this is prone to bleed and again cause <coughs> massive hemoptysis. How about <coughs> bronchogenic carcinoma invading the pulmonary arterial trunk? It's about 8% about in the series that we have reviewed a while ago. And then it could cause massive hemoptysis. Cystic uh, fibrosis, which will be the main uh, bulk of this talk uh, this morning. So you would see <coughs> a lot of cystic, uh, yeah, cystic changes, inflammatory reaction. It will, it will cause the <coughs> bronchial artery to hypertrophy in here. <coughs> Left side is being shown, the right side is being shown, both of them are hypervascular. And congenital lesion, this is somebody with uh, <coughs> a severe tetralogy of flow, systemic supply into the lungs. Remember that this diffusion blood flow into the lung. <coughs> so it has to recruit somewhere else, and recruitment is through the systemic circulation. And that's the reason why <coughs> when they do uh, uh, <coughs> definitive surgical procedure for tetralogy flow, sometimes they ask the radiologist in to intervene, like do a preoperative embolization of the uh, enlarged uh, systemic collaterals, this diminished blood loss during the surgical procedure. This is an adult tetralogy flow, so you would see <coughs> the tortosity of the collaterals and you will see the rib notching caused by the enlargement of the intercostal. What's the natural history of hemoptysis? <clears throat> Mortality, 7% soon after the onset. Higher in uh, tuberculosis, about 19%. About 9 to 10% in various cases, but very high in cystic fibrosis, about 32%. What is the course after the initial episode? Bleeding stop in five days. Bleeding stops after three days in 75% of the cases. And bleeding stops in all by day six. Management, <coughs> of course, you have to protect the airway. Localize the source and the cause of the bleeding and administer specific therapy. Initial management, of course, ICU. And then multidisciplinary approach, pulmonology, thoracic surgery, IR, and the other support services. If the bleeding decreases and the patient is stabilized, there should be mild sedation and cough <coughs> suppression. And if the bleeding site is known, the patient should be put in a lateral decubitus position with the bleeding side down, so you have to protect the relatively normal lung from aspira aspirating the hemoptysis. If oxygenation is compromised or bleeding continues, then the patient should be intubated. And this is the ACR appropriateness criteria for hemoptysis, of course. Everybody should have a chest radiograph. But I just would like to emphasize this one. The ACR also recognizes that <coughs> surgery versus transcatheter embolization, both of them are effective. But we should try first embolization before going into the last resort of <coughs> lung resection. And then, with regards to the use of contrast-enhanced MDCT, they also recognize that. It could, it could define the source. It could be bronchial, it could be systemic, it could be non-bronchial, or it could, be, it could be pulmonary arterial system. At the same time, it guides you. Because uh, if you know that the bleeding is pulmonary arterial system, so instead of doing a bronchial arteriogram, you go right away into a pulmonary arteriogram, or a systemic non-bronchial, you do an aortogram, you, you go into the subclavian and look at all the branches of the subclavian at the same time, look at the inferior prenic branches that could also supply uh, hemorrhoids that's coming from the lower lobes. So this is a very busy slide, <coughs> but this is the algorithm for massive hemoptysis. So you have to categorize, am I dealing here with an unstable patient? 
am I dealing here with somebody suspicious of uh, pulmonary embolism? So you have to do your uh, <coughs> clinical prediction rule. The clinical prediction rule for pulmonary embolism is use the Wells criteria, you use the PISA criteria, or you, 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 you use the uh, Swiss criteria. All of this uh, have been validated, but the most widely used is use the Wells criteria. If your Wells criteria is very high, then of course you have to rule out pulmonary embolism first. Then <coughs> decide if the patient is stable enough. If the patient is stable, then you have the luxury of going to do a CT scan. And these are the, your checklists. Am I dealing here with interstitial lung disease? Am I dealing here with an infiltrate? Am I dealing here with a cavity? Am I dealing here with a fungal infection? Am I dealing here with a nodule or multiple cystic lesions? Then if the patient is unstable, there, there is no argument. So intubation, transfusion, thoracic surgery consult, and early bronchoscopy. And if the bleeding site is localized, they can do tamponade. And then if it's, not <coughs> and if it's stabilized initially, then they can combine it with bronchial artery embolization. But if the bleeding is not initially localized, of course, it has to go to IR, arteriogram. The bleeding site is localized, then arteriogram is performed. <coughs> How do we compare the use of <coughs> bronchoscopy and CT? Which one is more productive in terms of diagnostic performance? <laughs> this is a this is just case series. Initial bronchoscopy was normal, a population of 40, and they did a CT scan, and they found out that abnormalities were seen in 50%. So in this particular case, bronchoscopy missed 50% of cases. And what are these? Bronchiectasis in 18%, mass in 10%, and consolidation in 10%. And abnormal blood vessels in about <coughs> less than 10% or 7.5%. Another study comparing CT versus bronchoscopy in hemoptysis. CT demonstrated all 27 tumors seen in the bronchoscopy, but additional seven that was initially missed by bronchoscopy. At the same time, they were able to detect 14% with bronchiectasis that was not seen by bronchoscopy. Another series, <coughs> the same problem, bronchoscopy versus CT. Uh, <coughs> a population of 58, in 17 cases, CT revealed areas with bronchiectasis that showed only many minim very minimal, not specific findings of bronchoscopy. Again, CT is ruling over bronchoscopy. And CT added additional staging information to bronchoscopy in 11 out of 21, about 50% of cases. <clears throat> what are the uh, prognostic indicators uh, related to mortality with hemoptysis? bleeding exceeding one liter within 24 hour period, a geographic evidence of aspiration, so you have to protect the airway from aspiration, and then hemodynamic instability and massive. So <clears throat> this, is only for, this is for our younger colleagues, so you have to localize the bleeding using <coughs> selective uh, catheterization. Once you localize the bleeding, so what you can do, you can inject a, a, a polyvinyl alcohol, these are dehydrated alcohol with different sizes, so you have to embolize at least before the pre-arterial le pre level. So you will, you, you, will, you will minimize the development of infarction. You will minimize the development of ischemia, especially if you are refluxing and, 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 and therefore if you're using smaller particles, it could reflux into an aberrantly arising anterior spinal artery. And one of the, one of the dreaded complications of this is inducing uh, ischemic paralysis of the spinal cord. So uh, as a rule, we're using only 300 to 500, but in my practice, I use 500 to 700. But, <coughs> but my, if, even if I go higher in terms of the size, my, my, my results are comparable to the results reported in the literature. So <coughs> you, you, <coughs> you inject the particles, and you do develop a hemostatic plug, and you control the bleeding. In <coughs> bleeding sites with larger blood vessels, or <clears throat> somebody with AV fistula, you, can just use, you cannot use the particle because the particle will, will just go into the pulmonary vein, it will go to the left atrium, it will go into the brain, so you will be, you, you will be, <coughs> you will be inducing stroke on the table. So if the bleeding site is caused by a large blood vessel or AV fistula, then no choice, you have to use a coil. Then properly sized coil, it should be about two millimeters larger than the size of the bleeding blood vessel, then you deploy it and a hemostatic plug is formed. So <coughs> a case of a 
45 year old male, uh, bleeding about 300 to 500 cc of, red, of bright red blood. Very minimal findings in the chest radiograph. Bronchoscopy showed blood in the right upper lobe. And <coughs> arteriogram has been done. You would see in here the hypertrophied right bronchial. This was selectively catheterized. It's called a Michelson catheter. It is a variant of the VS catheter or the metrogium catheter. <laughs> it's just very easy to slide and go into the bronchial artery with this <coughs> particular um, Michelson catheter. Selective injection has been done. So this is an intercostal bronchial trunk. This is the bronchial component. This is the intercostal component. And then you have to be very, very careful. Look for the un, uh, spinal artery. There's a midline course and a hairpin turn. It's very characteristic morphology. And at the same time, you look also for reflux into the pulmonary circulation. Then preambulization, postembolization. You would see that you preserve the trunk because here is the area of the origin of the anterior spinal artery, so you have to preserve this one. And then you have achieved your goal. You have obliterated the area of the bleeding site. Aspergillioma. It could recruit supply for non-bronchial as well as bronchial circulation. In here, a lot of hypervascularity. Yes, that's the main supply, the right bronchial hypervascularity, look at the tumor enhancement, uh, the enhancement within the <coughs> fungal infection. And <coughs> one thing that you can do in combination with bronchial artery embolization is you can do a CT guided puncture into the cavity and you can inject alcohol for additional obliteration of the cavity. Cystic fibrosis case, <coughs> so you would see right bronchial very hypervascular, very tortuous, very enlarged, embolized, preservation of the intercostal component, and total control of the hypervascularity within the lesion. What are the results? <coughs> uh, <coughs> several series. The largest series was uh, Rapkin. Uh, <coughs> this is in uh, <coughs> Carolina, South Carolina, <coughs> the 77%. <coughs> And then a high of 92%. But look at, <coughs> look at the number of population. It was about 13. When you look at the recurrence, it could range from 15%, a series of 41, and to as high as 23%, because they have higher population, significantly, significantly higher than the one in here with the lowest uh, recurrence rate. If you look at more recent review, a more recent review uh, publication in 2010, about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten studies <coughs> re reviewed in here in this particular table, you would see that um, immediate control could range from 73% to as high as 99%. And recurrence could, <coughs> uh, could <coughs> be as low as 10%, but could be as high as 55%. Surgical resection is preferred in the following instances. <coughs> When embolization is unavailable, of course. When bleeding continues despite repeated embolization. When the volume of the blood that is expect expectorated is so extreme that it will threaten survival. And then number four, when it is imprudent to transfer the patient to the cath lab, very unstable. And then number five, when the cause of hemoptysis is unlikely to be controlled, and what are these? suspected pulmonary artery rupture. Number two, rupture of mycetoma with profuse collateral supply. So the patient is profuse of bleeding. You cannot go after all the systemic collaterals. So a case presentation now. This is a 21-year-old with the first episode of cystic fibrosis, known cystic fibrosis being followed up by the pediatric service. A first episode uh, <coughs> that was uh, about three days before it, uh, he was referred to us about one, cup, one half cup of bright red blood, and then again, a recurrence about <coughs> a day before the procedure. So <coughs> without doubt, this is a very typical case of cystic fibrosis. So you look at the anatomic bias, upper, lo upper lobe anatomic, uh, anatomic bias for the cystic, fibro cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, hyperinflation on the right lung, and then a loss of volume on the left lung. But you will see that the, the findings are more severe on the left side. 
So we have the luxury of having an MDCT. So we, we got an MDCT. So <clears throat> just follow this one. So this is a large bronchial artery arising from the anterior wall of the aorta. Let's follow it. Follow it down. It goes into the left hilum. It's going to perfuse that more severe cystic changes and bronchi bronchiectatic changes on the left upper lobe. So uh, based on this, we, 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 we surmise that the most likely culprit is on the left upper lobe supplied by the left bronchial artery. I did not see any evidence of non-bronchial uh, non uh, collateral supply coming from the subclavian or <coughs> coming from <coughs> the lateral thoracic or internal mammary. So a recon. So you would see in here, large left bronchial, left bronchial as it goes into the lesion. A recon, very large, and then a very beautiful display using 3D. So we did <coughs> the initial survey. So from the initial survey, you know, it was exclusively coming from the bronchial. And then we, select, uh, we did selective injection of this one. It's a common trunk serving this very uh, the significantly larger left bronchial and then serving also the right side and <coughs> the hypervascularity in the <coughs> left side and a minimal hypervascularity in the right side as well and then you would see the larger size on the left side <coughs> a better injection you would see the uh, difference in the hypervascularity of the left side and the right side so we did <coughs> a coaxial uh, uh, microcatheter insertion. So you see the microcatheter inserted through this bigger catheter. <clears throat> That's it. And then it was selectively go beyond, <clears throat> beyond the uh, extra parenchymal segment of the bronchial artery. So this is the finis. <coughs> this is the uh, injection. And you will see the hypervascularity. This is the uh, pre-embolization injection. And then this is the finished product after embolization. So we were able to obliterate the hypervascularity in the lesion on the <coughs> left side. And then <coughs> injection afterward, you would see no more flow. And now the flow is preferentially going to the right side. So let's take a look at evidence-based data on <coughs> massive hemoptysis in cystic fibrosis. So the, the best evidence will be coming from the registry. They have about 28,858 observed in a 10-year period. This is the uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And then based on this, massive hemoptysis annual incidence is about 0.87%, meaning one out of 100 will have bleeding in a one-year period. And the overall <coughs> incidence of massive hemoptysis is about 4.1%. <coughs> If you look at the first episode of massive hemoptysis, most of them will have their massive hemoptysis beyond 18 years old, about 75% of them. And as you look at the graph, you would see that most of them now, about 100% of them, will have at least one episode of hemoptysis at probably after age 45, before age 50. <clears throat> How about impairment of FEV1, the pulmonary uh, function impairment? You would see that even at the first episode of massive hemoptysis, you would see that about 60%, the FEV1 uh, severe impairment of less than 40% of the predicted value, about 60%. And what are the risk factors for massive hemoptysis? There are only two <laughs> based on these several variables. You would see in here that infection with uh, staph aureus is one, with uh, <laughs> odds ratio of about 1.3. And having diabetes also one, with an odds ratio of about 1.12. How about survival? <coughs> Following massive hemoptysis, you would see that survival in here is about 35% before <coughs> reaching two years post-hemoptysis. It's quite high. And you would see that uh, <coughs> The median survival, 50% survival of five years, 50%. So it's a significant problem with cystic fibrosis. Now <coughs> the question is, does the bronchial artery embolization influence 
or have an impact on the clinical course and survival. We know it's very effective in controlling the hemoptysis, but does it, does it have an impact on survival? Does it prevent the need for transplantation? Let's take a look at the, their data. Uh, this is, these are consisting of 297 patients with uh, cystic fibrosis hospitalized in a 14 period observation, uh, obser uh, retros a retrospective review of 14 period. The mean age is about 27 plus minus nine. And then they did a case control study. So <clears throat> even though it retrospective, they were able to increase the level of evidence when making it a case control study. The, exper uh, the experimental group, 30 patients with major or persistent hemoptysis that required <coughs> bronchial artery embolization. And the control group is those without hemoptysis and therefore no need for <coughs> bronchial artery embolization. <coughs> Let's take a look at their initial baseline demographic data. This is very important because we have to know at the outset that both groups are comparable. There are no significant differences in the variables that would, that would influence the outcome. And you will see in here that all of these variables, uh, yeah, age, uh, gender, the use of the drugs, diabetes, uh, resistance to pseudomonas, oxygen dependence, and then FEV1, and the body mass index, you will see in here that the p-value is all of them are less than 0 0.05. So there's no significant difference at the outset. There's no significant difference as far as this patient characteristic is concerned. So at the outset, all groups are comparable. <coughs> Let's take a look at the results. You would see in here that the need for lung transplantation or occurrence of death and or lung transplantation is higher in the embolization group. You would see that the uh, relative risk of lung, transpla trans lung transplantation in the embolization group is high, 11. Uh, mortality or lung transplantation is high, 7.5. And then if you include death alone, in relative risk, you would see it's about three. So meaning it doesn't impact long-term results, but you need embolization to prevent early death from the massive hemoptysis. Survival without lung transplantation, if you look, if you look at the two groups, the embolization group definitely uh, lower survival. <clears throat> Look at how the graph would separate beyond a zero time. And then how about <clears throat> the other results? You would see in here that <clears throat> using univariate analysis, the one uh, the the, the uh, um, patient uh, variables that would influence the occurrence of death or lung transplantation, you would see that. Multi-drug resistance, the pseudomonas is one. Oxygen dependence is one. Uh, the FEV1, reduction in FEV1, increased body mass index, and, uh, uh, and uh, embolization is also one. And if you look at multivariate analysis, even with do, doing multivariate analysis, you would see that there is no, there, there, there is no significant, uh, there, this does a slight, uh, a slight increase in embolization, meaning uh, there could be some influence of other factors. But the, change in the, uh, but the change in the relative risk is of 6 to 6.27. But although you can argue that the p-value is 0.002. How about the others? When you look at oxygen dependence, looking at multivariate analysis, you would see that the, 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 the difference between the univariate and multivariate is not significant. And therefore, oxygen dependence alone does not predict bad outcome. It has to be in combination with other variables. How about FEV1? The, the change in the multivariate analysis, you would see just less than 0 0.05, meaning alone or in combination, it is a significant yeah, predictor of survival or the need for trans transplantation. How about the Kaplan-Meier curve? You would see in here that five-year recurrence of hemoptysis is about 38% at five years. So based on this, they came up with the following conclusions. We cannot argue it is effective for controlling hemoptysis, but those who have undergone 
embolization for hemoptysis, higher risk of respiratory function aggravation. Because remember that the bronchial artery also supplies the, the, bronchial, the bronchial tree. They also supply the visceral pleura. So you could just, you could just imagine uh, the, the, effect on the, uh, the effect on the respiratory function, FEV1, if you devascularize the visceral pleura by doing <coughs> embolization of the bronchial artery. Higher risk of death, <coughs> higher need for lung transplantation, and more likely to undergo lung transplantation than to present with recurrent major hemoptysis. So let's take a look at the guidelines. So the guidelines is still current, about publication in 2010. But the problems in the guidelines, they are not based on evidence. It's based on consensus. It's by the Delphi method, so they just, they, they, they just vote. So let's take a look at this problem. Which patient should undergo bronchial artery embolization with cystic fibrosis? There is no consensus on this, but at least they agree that uh, if, the, if a major hemoptysis does not stop spontaneously, then they have to go into bronchial artery embolization. But what is the definition of massive? What is the definition of being significant? And some of the panelists believe that there are some patients who are best treated with embolization even in the absence of further bleeding. Because their argument is that they want to prevent recurrence. Remember that recurrence is very high, <laughs> the data that we have shown a while ago. But again, there are those who disagree because they are, af they are, they are afraid of the potential complications, especially the <laughs> possibility of inducing spinal cord ischemia. How about this problem? Which studies should be performed in patients before bronchial artery embolization? Again, the consensus is split on this, but they agree that bronchoscopy is not needed. They've shown a while ago, comparing the performance of CT versus bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy is inferior to <coughs> the CT scan. How about CT scan? Again, the consensus is split. Some would, uh, <coughs> some would advocate it. The others would argue it will, just, it will just eat up your time and it will delay your performance of a life-saving procedure doing a bronchial artery <coughs> embolization. So what is the uh, preferred strategy? Shall you embolize only the culprit or do bilateral embolization? Again, the consensus is divided in this. Some would argue you only have to embolize the area of the culprit blood vessels, again, because of the potential complications. On the other side, they would prefer to embolize everything that is hypertrophied bilaterally to avoid recurrence of hemoptysis. <clears throat> is lung resection contraindicated in patients with cystic fibrosis? Again, they are divided in this, and then they agreed that uh, the term never should not be used in the guideline, so it's a, it's a judgment call. Again, uh, this one, what is the clinical outcome? This is a prospective study. At least this is, uh, this, is the, the, this, is the, this is the best evidence that I can get. The rest are the retrospe retrospective study. The, the level of evidence is better, is better with you. <coughs> uh, at least uh, I, I, I wasn't able to look at clinical trials. There are no clinical trials. And of course, there are no systematic review or meta-analysis. The best that I could get is a prospective study. <coughs> and the question is, do we need MDCT before bronchial artery embolization? They look at 27 patients, 11 men, 6 women, with an age group 22 to 70, with hemoptysis with indications for bronchial artery embolization. They look at the MDCT, look, at, uh, <laughs> look for the presence of hypertrophied bronchial and non-bronchial systemic arteries causing hemoptysis, and then compare it with a DSA. When you look at the results, prior TB is the number, number one cause, about 52%. Bronchiectasis is about 22%, and about 89% presented with either, either massive or recurrent moderate hemoptysis. When you look at the CTA results, there were about 27 abnormal bronchial artery, 17 were on the right side, 10 <coughs> were on the left, and the mean diameter is 2.9 on the right, the mean diameter on the left is 
The consensus is that you have to embolize the bronchial artery, the threshold is above two millimeters. And <coughs> most of the, the bronchial artery are, arose from T5, and about 7.3% is ectopic, meaning outside T5 or outside T6. And then it is interesting observation that among the right bronchial, the origin was on the medial wall. So this is, again, very helpful to the uh, interventional radiologist on how to direct the catheter when looking for the right bronchial. And how about the left bronchial? The origin was anterior in about 70%. <clears throat> how about the non-bronchial artery? About 41% <clears throat> and large. And all, uh, almost all of them, except for one, they had pleural thickening. So this, that is the clue. When you look at the CD scan, you have pleural thickening that is more than three millimeters. So that is the threshold, three millimeters. You have to look for enlargement of the non-bronchial systemic circulation, aside from the bronchial. So you have to search for all the branches of the subclavian, look at the internal mammary, look at the inferior phrenic bilaterally. Only one patient with abnormal non-bronchial artery had normal pleura, and it was a case of intralobal sequestration. Among the 11 patients here, about 3%, about 11% three, about had normal bronchial. So the bleeding was exclusively coming from the non-bronchial systemic <coughs> blood supply. And then about two, it is about 7.4% were unsuitable for embolization. One was the intralobal sequestration, and the other one with chronic thromboembolism with uh, systemic collaterals to the pulmonary circulation. So the question is, is this enough for us to justify the use of routine <coughs> pre-IR uh, <coughs> pre MDCT? It only changed their decision making in about 7.4%. Is that enough? May maybe I would say so, but about 10%. You can change your decision making and look for other causes of <coughs> uh, hemoptysis. But of course, somebody with cystic fibrosis, you already know, you know cystic fibrosis. So you have to go to right away to the bronchial and then systemic, <coughs> non-bronchial systemic blood supply if the pleura is uh, taken. So let's go into the <coughs> algorithm. So CT the thorax, again, the consensus conference, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, they are divided on this. But I, I do believe it's just my personal opinion if you have the luxury of time, the patient is stable enough, you have time to do your MDCT. The MDCT is very quick, 64 slides per second, so you're done in no time at all. <clears throat> and then if it is unstable, this goes to bronchial artery embolization, it's stable also bronchial artery embolization. If it fails initially, you have to repeat that. And then if it fails again, then you have to consider <coughs> performance of surgery. <coughs> Let's look at outcome. This is a 10-year review, 18 patients hospitalized for 29 occasions, underwent 36 procedures. You would see that overall efficacy in the first session is 75%. After two, 89%. After a third one is 93%. But the overall recurrence rate is 46% very high. Mean time of recurrence is 12 months. And there are high incidence of bleeding from non-bronchial colla uh, collateral systemic circulation. There were two deaths despite uh, su successful uh, embolization. And three, it's very high, three had transient neurologic deficit during the embolization process. If, you <coughs> if they pulled this with other older studies, one in 1995 and one in 1979, they were able to increase the initial control to 90%. And then <coughs> other related study, a publication in 2006, uh, a longer follow-up period, with a slightly higher number of BAE, initial control is higher, 97%, and the recurrence rate is 23%. It depends on the center, of course. Complications, chest pain is the most common one. Remember that the visceral pleura is supplied by the bronchial circulation, so you expect some chest pain, 24 to 90%. Dysphagia, esophagus is also supplied by the bronchial, so about 1 to 18%. Inadvertent embolization of the spinal artery, it could range from 1.4 to 6.5%, so significance, about 7%. 
ischemic colitis, probably that is, is, I don't know the reason why, probably you're showering it downstream and you were not careful with the, <coughs> with the catheter and some of the particles went downstream and went into the SMA, but that should not be. This should not occur, ischemic colitis should not occur. Because there's, there's no way for the bronchial circulation to supply the, supply the mesenteric circulation. Pulmonary infarction, transient blindness, and bronchoesophageal fistula. So this is the uh, second case. So this will just be a show and tell. We don't have enough time. It is a transfer case from an outside hospital, hemoptysis. <coughs> it was initially managed. Actually, the IR in that particular hospital already did, so, did some arteriogram. And they found an arteriogram, which is an AVM, unusual AVM. And they did not pursue the embolization. It was referred to us. <coughs> so you would see in here a lot of lung changes, infiltrates, uh, loss of volume. But what we cannot define in here, what's happening within the hilum. It doesn't look like the characteristic plain film appearance of an AVM, but again, there's some nodularity, there's some irregularity, but it's not the clear cut textbook description of an AVM. I don't see a large blood vessel coursing to it. I don't see any feeding vessel. So <coughs> they did an MDCT, so just watch this one. I, did, uh, I failed to make an error, so what's the internal mammary? We are going to trace it down, trace it down, and you see this malformation here, retrosternal area. This was the AVM. And then <coughs> farther down, you would see that it, it, it communicates with the pulmonary vein. And you follow it as it drains into the left atrium. A recon that they provided us, <coughs> we were not able to do recon of this because the, the images were taken outside. So this is the single recon that they did. You will see the slightly enlarged internal mammary in comparison to the left side, and you will see this extensive longitudinal extent of the AVM. So <coughs> we did uh, <coughs> go right <coughs> into the right subclavian, and then selective into the internal mammary. So you would see the enhancement of the malformation. Then later on, you would see enhancement of the pulmonary vein. But <coughs> we were not satisfied with the pictures we're getting because for you to embolize this, it's very hard. You don't see a lot of details. So we did a better injection. In this better injection, now you would see more morphology. There are a lot smaller. There's an idus in here, but there are smaller ones. Practically about three-fourths of the length of the right hemithorax medially. Then you would see better morphology. You would see now the pulmonary vein in the upper lobe on the right side. And then later on, you would see also the pulmonary vein inferiorly also involved. Pulmonary vein, pulmonary vein, left atrium. So we did measure the pulmonary artery at different segments to properly size our coil. And then progressively, we went down with the microcatheter down to the distal segment. And now we are here in the distal segment. This is the distal branches, the one that is perfusing the inferior pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein, we are beginning to see it. Pulmonary vein, and then pulmonary vein before it drains into the left atrium. So <coughs> we did embolize. Sorry about that. This is the, the one that we dropped in the distal segment. And then later on, this is the one <coughs> distal to the main nidus. This is the one proximal to the main nidus. And then we decided to embolize the entire blood vessel. Because remember, the extent of the AVM is longitudinal. And that is the finished product. <coughs> we use about 18 coils, different sizes. And <coughs> post embolization arteriogram, so it's occlusion, and the coils. A follow up, about two months, you will see that the density initially seen in here is no longer seen. The density that was shown in here is no longer seen, it's a little bit clearer now. And the stable location of the coils. That was before, and that was <coughs> two months after.
Okay. Anybody has a question for um, Don Cabrera? Or would you like to make any panel comments or something like that about the issue? Uh, about the last case, I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to discuss with you. This is a rare case. And I think uh, Dr. Chada, when, uh, when she was in uh, Cleveland, uh, she co authored a case report of a similar case, but the similar case, it was induced by a tuberculosis. There was, uh, there, there was a history of active tuberculosis. But this one, there's no tuberculosis. And most of the, most of the case reports that you see in the, in, in the literature this are mostly induced by surgery, complications of thoracic cardiovascular surgery. I have to search some more because I instructed uh, Ibrahim to make a case report on this. It's not routine for us to do a hemodynamic study. Probably that we should start doing that, a hemodynamic study before the procedure. And, uh, and some of them can present with a cyanosis, a short breath, or something like that because of all the uh, common rehabilitation. Yeah, this one, there was no, yeah, there was no cyanosis before. He just presented initially with already massive hemoptysis. Okay, so if a patient presents without bleeding, what's your first choice of diagnosis? I know you did a CT scan. So CTA will have to play an important role. It, it, it was already att attempted in an outside hospital. In fact, they did twice arteriogram, but they but but they they, they back out because uh, because probably they uh, I was told they were not confident because of the ex extent of the of the AVM, or probably I can surmise that probably they don't have all the materials needed during that time. Yeah, CTA probably will tell you if the communication between this internal uh, internal thoracic artery. Yeah and the pulmonary artery and they, you can rotate and you can see it's inside the wall of yeah. the chest and they'll probably give more yeah. information. And also roll up some other pathologies. And yeah. if it's not bleeding, you don't have to go in to do a, you know, a DSA first, right? That's yeah. what that. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably the reason why even though the uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation are divided with regards to the routine use of MDCT, I believe MDCT should be, if you have the luxury of time, the patient is stable enough, get an MDCT. It's just very quick to get an MDCT. For this amortization of the internal thoracic artery or internal memory artery, whatever you, you know, we call, what's the major concern about the complications? I know when you did the lack of systemic fibrosis, you got yeah. some... Pro 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 yeah, probably not, because I did not use particles, so I'm not worried that particles going into the microcirculation all I used were purely 18 pieces of coil. Okay. And during the last follow-up, I, I, I already did a two, twice follow-up. The patient is doing well. So, uh, uh, I, was, I, was, I, I was just kidding, and probably your breast will shrink. Yeah. What they present with the chest pain or something? Or? No, no chest pain. No, no chest pain. No chest pain. No worry about no, no that. Worry. That's that's the, that, right. that, I mean, that's, okay. that's that's the only one. That, that, that's the only one thing. When when in the future you will need the bypass, of course you already sacrificed one of the internal memory. Right, and uh, you can yeah like uh, you know cardiology, uh, cardiac surgery always uh, obvious or just uh, use that for cabbage, but you know uh, so nothing else you worry about. You just kind of coil it and that should be fine. Yeah, that's nice. Wonderful.